it's always interesting when people talk about the salinity or saltiness of wine. Is that a taste for you or is it just something that's akin to acidity? There are examples with Highland or coastal wine regions where there is perceptible salt in the wine, like there's salt on the grapes when they come in from the vineyards. You are getting the effect of salt as a flavor enhancer in the wine. Sometimes it's a perception thing, but I do think that you can taste the salt. It's like the only mineral we can taste. So it's the one case where minerality is actually a thing. Right. Like the eucalypt oils can settle on the grapes. Yeah. Or you find it with sort of resinous herbs in the south of France or even lavender. What is growing around the grapes can have an impact. Do you have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people, hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Is food and wine pairing the ultimate goal of every dining experience? Is it okay to tell sommeliers if you don't like the wine they recommended? And what's it like serving famous captains of industry like Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates? You'll get those answers, plus lots more wine-tasting tips and stories, in part two of my conversation with Zach Jabal, a Seattle-based wine writer, educator, and sommelier. You don't need to have listened to part one from last week first, but I hope you'll go back if you missed it after you finish this one. I wanted to let you know that I'm hosting an online tasting on Thursday, June 10th of some wonderful rosé wines that you'll want to sip all summer long. I'll also give you tips on pairing them with food and serving them in the right glass for maximum pleasure. There is no cost for this tasting, but space is limited, so please register today at nataliemclean.com forward slash Rose. That's rose without the accent to D. I'll include this link in the show notes, along with a full transcript of our conversation, how you can join me in our free online wine and food pairing class, and where you can find me on Zoom, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube live video every Wednesday at 7 p.m. That's all in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 131. Now on a personal note before we dive into the show. This past Tuesday, Miles and I had another couple over. There were folks outside our family bubble, and it was the first time in more than a year that we had done that. We were all vaccinated, and we kept physically distanced. I really don't like the term socially distanced, because I want to socialize again, even as an introvert. It felt so good to have a conversation about things Miles and I are not talking about every day. It was like when your teacher gave you an interesting assignment in grade school that you actually liked. For example, talk with your neighbor about your favorite toy rather than how I spent my summer vacation. (laughs) Although I'm looking forward to summer vacation. We also shared some great wines. Ours was new to them and the bottle they brought was new to us. It really felt like our minds, our spirits, and our palates were reviving from some dark, buried place. Have you had this experience yet? Let me know. Okay, on with the show. Let's go to before times, the happier times when you were <laughs> yes, working please. in restaurants, whether it was at Dahlia Lounge or another restaurant. What were some of your most memorable experiences while working on the floor or anything related to a restaurant? wine list and so on. Do any of those experiences, particular experiences stand out for you? Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things that when looking back on it was so interesting about what I did and about the job was that wine is viewed by so many people as this incredibly intimidating, almost impenetrable subject that nonetheless, they're supposed to know something about. The number of people on a night who would tell me, oh, I know I should know more about this, right? Wine shame. (laughs) Yeah. 
And they would, in the same breath, like I said, express, oh, wine is so complicated, but I should know something about it. And I mean, I think that knowing something about wine is great. I mean, I obviously you, everyone watching and listening to this, presumably is interested in knowing things about wine. So you all agree that knowing things about wine is great and wine, it can bring a lot of pleasure in a lot of different ways, including an intellectual pleasure. But the thing that for me was always such a fun experience was whenever I could kind of disarm that fear, that shame, you know, I think the sommelier profession got a, well, not a bad rap. It was a deserved rap in a lot of cases because there are so many people who saw, I think, that role as an opportunity to impress the guest, right? To say to the guest, allow me to show you how much more than you I know. And let me potentially bully you into buying a wine that you may or may not like, that you may or may not know anything about. But I have bullied, shamed, coerced you into buying. And then if you don't enjoy it, it's because you're a bad wine drinker. Right. You have no taste. (laughs) Yeah. And I just, I grew up in and around restaurants after the restaurant review phase, or at least after the meal at Dolly Lounge, my dad ended up getting remarried to a woman who owned a restaurant in Seattle. I, I spent a lot of time in and around that. And then obviously working in restaurants. And I really came to being a sommelier as a service professional first. It's not as if that's what I set out to do. You know, I really thought when I started working in restaurants, my goal was eventually to own a, my own restaurant, to run it as the you know owner general manager. And so I worked as a buster, I worked as a server, as a bartender, you know, all these parts of the job, I mean, briefly as a cook, but it was not for me. And it wasn't until I really started finding myself getting more merged in wine that I became a wine focused professional. But I think when you work in restaurants that fo- emphasize service, emphasize really customer focused and oriented service, then when wine is that facet for that, you know, you bring a degree of trying to put the guest at ease and comfort. How did you do that? What would you say specifically? Can you remember? I think what I tried to do were a few different techniques. One is without being dismissive, trying to be as informal as possible. So, you know, one of my favorite things to do with tables was to be as candid as I could reasonably be to say, hey, you know, look, especially with the wine program that I built, I was like, hey, look, you know, I picked all these wines. I think they're all quite good, but not every person is going to like every wine. So like, that's totally fine. Tell me what you like. And we've got wines on there. I also, this is maybe a tangent or a broader topic. I believe in food and wine pairing in the sense that I certainly believe that certain foods and certain wines go well together and certain foods and certain wines maybe don't go as well together. But I don't believe in food and wine pairing as the ultimate goal of every dining experience. Why not? I was just curious. Because I think that for a lot of people, people know what they like to eat for the most part, right? They have a pretty good sense because people eat three-ish meals a day every day. Wine you and I have a tremendous experience with wine. And so I can sit down and say, I know I'm having this dish and I have a pretty good idea for what kind of wine is going to go well with it. And I'm probably going to want the wine that pairs well with it. But for a lot of people, their wine drinking is relatively narrow. You know, they drink a lot of full-bodied red wines and that's what they like in wine. And they know they want to have wine with their meal, but if they're going to order halibut or they're going to order salmon or they're going to order a lasagna or whatever, like it doesn't matter what the food is. Sometimes they may say to me, or they might've said to me, what do you think pairs well with this? But the honest truth is that most people really want to drink a wine that they know they're going to like, Sure. eat a food they know they're going to like. And as long as it's not absolutely the worst combination possible, and sometimes even when it is like the tables that would sit down and order two dozen oysters and a bottle of Cabernet, like (laughs) I wouldn't want to do that, but it's not my place to tell the guests that they shouldn't do that. That's their business. It's just like, I wouldn't order a well-done steak, but I also don't tell people they can't have a well-done steak. If that's what makes them happy, exactly. that's fine. Pair the wine to the diner, not the dinner, whoever said exactly. that. Exactly. And so to me, it's really just, it was always about making people feel like as best as I could. And obviously, you know, you never can be a hundred percent this way because people are going to think what they want, but it's like, I'm not here to judge you. I'm not here to try and bilk you out of, you know, I'm going to recommend sometimes less expensive wines. Like of the wines you're thinking about, if I think the less expensive one is a better wine for you, I'm going to recommend that. You know, those things all pay off in terms of buy-in from your guests over time. And to me, it was really just about, you know, my job was to try and put someone in a position where they were going to enjoy their experience wholly. And if they enjoyed the wine particularly, that's great. But if after having a meal with a bottle of wine and dinner, the thing they were most excited about was the dessert, it's a team effort in the restaurant. And so my job isn't to try and be the star every game. You know, sometimes it's just to be in the background. And sometimes, you know, it happens people walk in, they know exactly what they want wine-wise. And my job was exclusively as sort of in the background as possible, open the bottle of wine, pour it for them and get get out of their way because they're doing other stuff. 
And so I think that a problem that people who come to the sommelier profession from outside of the restaurant industry largely don't have a lot of restaurant experience before they move into a role like that is they think they're supposed to be the star of the show. It's the same thing with service, right? I mean, it was true as a server too, right? Sometimes you are the star of the show to a table. Sometimes they want you to be the entertainment. They want to talk to you. They want to know about you. They want your recommendations. And sometimes they don't. Sometimes it's a date. Sometimes it's business. Sometimes it's just people who aren't interested in you. They're interested in the people they're dining. And that's, I mean, again, fine. It wasn't my job. You know, if I wanted to perform, I would be in the performing arts. I mean, I like a certain amount of performance and it was sometimes fun to have tables that were interested in that. But if they were all that way, it would be exhausting. And it would, you know, I'd be in the weeds the whole night. And so the same thing with wine, you have to find and learn to recognize when you step it up a little bit for people because they want that and when to be as inobtrusive as possible so that they are not caught up in your thing. They're enjoying their experience. So for me, the other piece of it that I would try and do with people is like, make it very clear to them that if they were unsure about a wine, what I would always say is like, look, if you don't like this wine, I'll drink it and we'll get you something else. And like so many people are so unfamiliar with how these things work in restaurants and are so afraid to turn away wine. And I think there's a difference. This is a long conversation and I, we can have this one if you want. But I think to me, my feeling was always as a sommelier and a wine director, if I recommended a wine, if I said, you know, you've told me what you like or what you're interested in. And I say, I think you'll like this wine and you don't like it. Then tell me, please don't drink it because you feel obligated to like, I will. Right. A lot of people do. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I'll drink it. I'll sell it by the glass. If there's nothing wrong with it, you just don't like it. Like I said, I'll glass pour it. I'll use it for staff training, whatever. And we'll get you something you do like. Same thing with food. I say, Hey, you know, you're going to really love the duck. You don't like the duck. We'll get you something else. Like that's not a problem. You know, it's a little different if someone comes in and orders a wine and then refuses it without kind of consulting with me. But, you know, even then, you know, we're not here to antagonize the guests for the most part. And I think for a lot of people just kind of being upfront about that, like, hey, look, you know, if this isn't what you want, talk, tell me, we'll figure something else out for you. It's not a big deal. You know, again, I wasn't running a wine program with $10,000 bottles of wine, where if someone ordered and then turned it away after opening it, there's a real problem. When your wines are in the two and three figures, that's a lot easier to kind of deal with, you know, even on the back end uh, accounting wise. I will say the other piece of this too, for me was always that I also really encouraged people to be honest with me about how much they wanted to try new things. You know, there's also a conception among diners, both food, drink, whatever, that they're somehow under obligation to try something new whenever they go out. And I told people all the time, Hey, look, if you have favorites, totally fine. I I mean, I dine out a lot or I did dine out a lot and some restaurants I would go in and every time I get the same thing. And yeah, I'm sure they made other good food. That's what I was in the mood for. And that's why I went to that restaurant. And so to me, it was never to tell someone, oh, you know, you have to try something new. Like it's totally valid to say, I know I like this wine from this producer. I see it on your list. Let's just have that. And I was like, you know, great. That's fine with me. I'd much rather you do that than feel like you have to try something new and then enjoy it less. Right. So. Absolutely. No. Did you ever serve anybody famous? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, in Seattle, I would say in various ways and various times, I served kind of all the famous, what you call them, captains of industry. So, you know, Howard Schultz and Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates and all those people. You served them all? Like you have come in? Oh, wow. Any particular wine choices there that stood out? You know, it's funny. I think actually, weirdly, no. The most memorable drink experience I had with a famous guest was actually back before I was a sommelier and I was a bartender and I made a couple of martinis for Al Gore, which was the most direct one of those. But, you know, it's not like the real captains of industry, at least at Dahlia Lounge, when they would dine, you know, they would have nice-ish wine, but they weren't ordering our most expensive bottles. And as I said before, we were not carrying First Growth Bordeaux and Grand Cru Burgundy particularly. So it wasn't like the kind of place where someone would spend tens of thousands of dollars on wine. That wasn't the setup. And none of them showed a particular aptitude or knowledge of wine? Like... Maybe Jeff Bezos with, (laughs) I don't know. You know, he's actually the person I think I only served one time. It's almost like, from my experience at least, with people of that ilk where they're very, very famous, unless they really make it clear that they want a lot from you, you you kind of just stay out of their way. They're kind of busy and (laughs) got things on their mind. (laughs) You know, it's kind of like the show is more for the people who are not going to be like, why is this person, you know, like, I don't know. It always just kind of seemed to me that if any person kind of, hinted that they want or kind of made it clear that they wanted a level of attention, then they would get it. But usually the very wealthy, if they're dining out, they just want to be left alone, mostly. You know, it's the same thing with celebrities who aren't necessarily uber wealthy, but are just recognizable, you know, you kind of leave it to them to dictate 
for me at least, was always you leave it to them to kind of dictate how much or how little they want of your services, such as it is. And usually they want less because they're surrounded by people who do things for them all the time. So they don't necessarily need that validation from me in the way that maybe just your average diner likes to have, some of them like to have the feeling of like, oh, here's someone who is waiting upon me. Right, right. That's true. So I want to share some of the photos that I have here. Okay, that'd be you. (laughs) That is me. That is a much younger me. This is, I think, one of my very first wine classes that I taught, like a private wine class. Uh, Great. Out of your home? Is that where you're teaching it? It's actually at my mother's home. Oh, okay. She lives in Bellingham, which is is about 90 minutes (laughs) north of Seattle. Well, I wasn't living at home. Oh, okay. (laughs) I did this class at her house for her and some of her friends. It was one of my very first sort of private venture paid classes. So probably, uh, I'm guessing, eight or so years ago now. Oh, okay. Not that long ago. (laughs) Well, you know. Is this at Dahlia Lounge? No, this is actually in France. This is oh. Dahlia Lounge was nowhere near this formal. My wife and I, or well, I guess at that point we were just engaged. This is in Avignon. Oh, nice. In the Rhone Valley. Yeah, a one-star Michelin restaurant. And just, I don't know, me looking Beautiful. fancy, yeah. looking at a fancy <laughs> wine list. And what are you doing here? This is me shucking an oyster. So this is on the Washington coast. This is part of the world of the Pacific Northwest is... Notable for a lot of things, but one of them is the bivalves and oysters in particular. And so this is at uh, Taylor Shellfish, which is a relatively large shellfish farming company here. And this is at one of their main farms, and they have a little like shack basically where you can buy oysters and you know go sit out and shuck them. So this is me doing that. Beautiful day. Do you have a favorite pairing for oysters? You know, it's funny actually. This is a this is a good question. So I think oysters are actually a harder food to pair with wine than people think. Why is that? I think it depends. I mean, obviously, oysters can vary a lot in terms of their flavor. I think that their pronounced saltiness in most cases is actually challenging for a lot of wines, including a lot of wines that are commonly paired. I personally find muscadet to be a not very exciting pairing with spark with uh, oysters. I, to me, I mean, it's just not a big fan of muscadet. Period. It's kind of, I don't feel like it has a lot going on in most cases. You know, with the exception maybe of some of the really extended age like cuisson versions and stuff like that. But even then. I like sparkling wine with them, but if it's the right sparkling wine, I think you have to be very careful that there's not too much fruitiness, with especially Pacific Northwest oysters, which do lean more into the sort of briny side of things. I mean, if we're sticking with wine, I think it's actually an area where I like something that's really going to have a lot of saltiness to it. So Vermentino from Sardinia, Assyrtico from Santorini, like very kind of islandy wines where they're, you're going to get that pronounced brininess. But honestly, my favorite pairing with oysters is either a really crisp beer or a martini. Uh, That's actually what I prefer. All right. Well, that's interesting. I just find it to be more pleasurable. Well, saltiness, it's always interesting when people talk about the salinity or saltiness of wine. Is that a taste for you or is it just something that's akin to acidity? I mean, I think it depends. I think there are examples you find with some of these really kind of island or coastal wine regions where there really is perceptible salt in the wine. Like, there's salt on the grapes when they come in from the vineyards. And I mean, not like huge amounts, but there's enough that I think you are really getting the effect of salt as a flavor enhancer in the wine. I think sometimes it's a perception thing, but I do think that you can taste the salt, for lack of a better word, in some cases. You know, it's like the only mineral we can taste pretty much. So it's the one case where minerality is actually a thing. Right. Who is it that talks about air war? You know, like the eucalypt oils can settle on the grapes. I forget who was bringing up that concept, but yeah, I can see that. Yeah, or you find it with some of the other things like some of the sort of resinous herbs in the south of France or even lavender sometimes, you know, what is growing around the grapes can have an impact. Sure. This must this is be my wedding day. Wedding day. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I love that. You've got Dom Perignon there. Yes, we were, we were gifted a bottle as sort of a pre-wedding present by, I think actually some of Caitlin's coworkers, uh, my wife's coworkers. And so we had dropped our things off at the hotel we were staying at. And then I just was like, you know what? It's my wedding day. I'm going to walk down the streets of Seattle on our way to our reception. We drank from the bottle on the way. So that was, that was us. (laughs) No one gave us a hard time. thankfully. No, I'll bet not. And then you had another top notch champagne here, the Tatanger or (laughs) Tatanger. So what my wife and I decided as part of our wedding was one thing we were very much in agreement on was Neither of us had any interest in a wedding cake. Neither of us really cared. My wife kind of likes cake, but I think we both felt like it was just, it was one piece of the ritual that we were not interested in. But we wanted there to be some sort of 
thing that was kind of analogous to the cutting of the cake. And so what we decided to do is get a couple of three liter bottles of Tatanger, as you said, and we each opened one and then that was used for the toast. And so it was kind of a thing that we could do together that was, again, kind of equivalent to cutting the cake, but, but was a little more true to us. Yeah. I love that idea. Get rid of the cake. And I'm sure that's the best champagne or bubbly that anyone's had at a wedding. <laughs> I mean, the- yeah, it's true that our, our wedding was, well, our wedding was noteworthy both for the quality of the alcohol in general. And also we didn't have like a full open bar. I did basically some batch cocktails because we just kind of wanted to keep things a little more streamlined for the venue. But I made the mistake, which is like a typical person who works in the drinks industry mistake of thinking that people would understand or would read. So one of the two drinks was like a punch of sorts, but it's, it was a true punch. So it was made with some spirit and then some sparkling wine. It didn't have, you know, juice or water or something. So a couple of people definitely had like a few glasses of punch beforehand. And by the time we actually got to like the reception part and all that, there was a little bit more drunkenness for a couple of folks than we cared for. Because they were like, I thought it was punch. You know, people think, you know, it's juice with a little alcohol. And I was like, no, this has all got alcohol in it. Right. Oh, that, was, that was a little bit of a mistake on my part, which, you know, it, was, it worked out okay. Well, sure. Everybody was very festive by the time yeah, they it was, got it to the quite public. Festive. <laughs> you did not get any pictures from later in the wedding. I'll tell no, you no, I noticed that. <laughs> this guy is adorable. Who is he? Yeah, he is a lot bigger now. So oh. this is, uh, this is my son, Solomon. So cute. I guess he would have been not quite a year old at this point. Oh, and starting this is actually him earlier. Us. Early. Oh, yeah. <laughs> This is us in British Columbia, actually, in the Okanagan Valley oh, at the beautiful. Quails Gate. Oh. He's doing some, I think, some leaf thinning. <laughs> yes, I was thinking, or he's going to be a, what do you call it, amplifographer or whatever. Amplifographer, yeah, That's exactly. it, that's it. Quails Gate's gorgeous winery there, gorgeous wines. Did you have lunch or dinner at the restaurant there? On this trip, yeah, I believe we had dinner there. I think this was probably, I've been up a couple of times. This one, I think we had Maybe this was an afternoon visit, and then we went back for dinner later or something. Oh, nice. Very nice. Who are these folks? So I'm obviously the second from the left here. And then on the far left is Madeline Puckett of Wine Folly, who's a friend of mine. And then to my right, or to the right of me, as you look at the picture, is Jess White. She's just a good friend and wine professional. And then on the far right is Nick Davis, who's now a master sommelier, another friend of mine. So this was us doing an event at Amazon a number of years ago that I put on for one of the teams there. So you can't quite tell from this picture, but they kind of encouraged us to, or I was encouraged to kind of pick some unusual wine. So there's Muscat from Alsace that Nick has there. I have a bottle of a Sirtico from Santorini. I actually can't remember what all the other ones are. There's some old German Riesling. It was meant to be kind of a like, let's try some odd wines for people whose drinking tends to lean towards the kind of more well-known varieties. So we kind of picked some, not oddballs exactly, but wines that people are probably much less familiar with. Oh, that's great. Great experience. And beautiful. Where are you here? Well, come on, Natalie. Can you guess? Moselle. That's correct. Yeah, this is uh, just outside of Burn Castle oh. on a riverboat looking up at the castle. Deep vineyards. Yeah. Love that. I will say this. I was there with my wife and actually my son when he was quite young. And, you know, I had been told by many people, oh, you know, the, the Moselle is beautiful and all that. But I was not prepared for just how strikingly beautiful it was upon visiting. I mean, we happened to get kind of, as you can maybe tell, we were there, this was in mid-October and it was just absolutely perfect, like sunny and warm, but not too hot. You know, everything was kind of in that stage. You can see the leaves starting to change in the trees, but not all the way. It was just, it was stunningly beautiful the whole time we were there, which was very cool. I just love visiting the Moselle. And I just remember how steep the inclines were, where the terraced vineyards were. And it was like, (laughs) I don't know, we were at the top of one vineyard and they said something like, we have to keep hiring new vineyard workers every year. I said, why? He said, because they roll down to the bottom and we never see them again or something like this. Because it's I all- assume that was a joke. <laughs> yes, 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 know. yes. It was. But they couldn't do any machine harvesting. It was all these people. But some of them, some of the slopes were so steep, they did wear harnesses. It was just crazy. Yeah. You go into some of them and you see there's a whole like pulley system and everything that people clip into. And, and also for the picking and for the picking baskets, you know, they put the grapes on a sort of like a pulley system because no one wants to carry them up these incredible slopes. Yeah, it's really striking. And, and also, you know, you see some parts throughout the, the Mosul where you find some of these vineyards and it's like they found every last possible, even marginally kind of cultivatable scrap of land 
with the proper orientation to the sun. So there's pieces where you like, you'll see basically the vineyard ends in a cliff. Like yes. it's very, <laughs> you're just like, man, you cannot be wandering here idly without know. You know, risking your life. I'm going to get that grape. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Oh, lovely region. Here you are. Looks like some cheesy business going on here. Yeah. So this is a Parmesan cheese producer in Bologna, or sorry, in Emilia Romagna rather, more broadly. And so this was, I was on a trip with a number of other sommeliers. This would have been in uh, November of 2018. It was a really cool experience. I mean, I've been to Italy a number of times, but this one was really cool because in part we got to go see with lots of wine, but also lots of sort of some of the attendant famous foodstuffs of Italy. So Parmesan cheese factory, you know, some balsamic vinegar producers, things like that, olive oil, et cetera. It was very cool. What surprised you most about the Parmesan making it? I mean, one, just how much they have. I mean, you can't fully get a great sense for this, but this is an absolutely enormous refrigerated warehouse room, just full of wheels of cheese. I mean, there must be millions of them in this facility. And it's far from the only one in the area. I mean, the scale of it was amazing. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, you think about how beloved and ubiquitous Parmesan is in the world, but it also is just a situation where I think, yeah, it was amazing to me to see that scaled up. And then, I mean, the other part is just kind of how rigorous the process is, how much is rejected. I don't remember the exact percentages, but, you know, everything you see there is finished. And all right, essentially, I think there's one, maybe one last test that it goes through before it's actually sold. But basically, all along the way, product is being rejected and either turned into something else, you know, downgraded. Like the there shredded other, cheese or something or whatever. You know, there are other kinds of, you know, hard cheeses, you know, don't have the, essentially the DOCG Parmesan kind of appellation. I'll, it's not technically DOCG, but whatever. It's something, the equivalent for foodstuffs in Italy. But before you ever get to this stage, there's a lot that gets sorted out. I can't wait to get into, I mean, I am into cheese and I've taught basic cheese and wine pairing, but I want to dive into that even more. I mean, just the world of cheese fascinates me with its variation like wine. <laughs> Where is this? So this is at my dad's house and this is me picking a bunch of nettles to make like nettle pesto and stuff. And I don't know, I just thought it was fun. It's a very like Seattle area, Pacific Northwest, gloves and raincoat. And- <laughs> what do nettles taste like? Uh, they taste like you really are desperate for green vegetables in the <laughs> early spring. I like nettle, like I like to sometimes fold nettle pesto or like nettle puree into pasta dough. It kind of is interesting. You know, it's like if you really like the taste of a mix of like spinach and grass, it's kind of somewhere between those two. It doesn't sound not, appetizing. I, I, I mean, it's fine. It's just not very, again, here, certainly there is a long period of time when basically the only sort of quote unquote fresh vegetables you get are basically just really hearty greens, right? Kale, chard, those kinds of things that are local and that are fresh. Obviously, you know, we get lots of produce from California and Mexico and stuff like that. And so if you want something that is new growth, it doesn't sort of have that really kind of hearty texture and just quality that those really hearty bitter greens have, then nettles are basically some of your first things. You know, I have a a sort of fondness for them because they do represent this sort of new growth spring thing. But I'm, I definitely don't seek them out outside of maybe a very narrow window in, in the like late winter, early spring. Right. Right about now. And of course, harvesting them is, you know, you have to be very careful. Prickly. They will sting you if you are not gloved and such. Ouch. So back to the beginning. Is this you? Yeah, this is me and my sister. Oh. Uh, one of my two sisters, actually. The other one Sweet. Is not yet born in this picture. <laughs> And so, yeah, this is just us at a family picnic or something. So cute. Looks like you're going to deck her after you give her a kiss. Well, that's a little bit emblematic of our relationship. <laughs> that's great. Equal parts love and violence. Oh, in some sense. lovely, lovely. Oh, my goodness. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed part two of my chat with Zach. Here are my takeaways. I thought Zach's tips on pairing crisp, minerally wines with oysters was spot on, and that he really should know what he's talking about coming from Seattle, where oysters are so popular and so very fresh. Two, I agree with Zach that food and wine pairing doesn't have to be the ultimate goal of every dining experience. Sometimes you just want to enjoy a wine that you love and a dish that's your favorite, and the two don't necessarily go together. 
My suggestion, as always, is take a bite of a bun in between and relax. And number three, I was glad to hear Zach say that it is perfectly fine to tell sommeliers that you don't like the wine they recommended. They've got a personal stake in your enjoying your wine and the meal, and more importantly, coming back again. In the show notes, you'll find a link to the free rosé tasting I'm hosting online on Thursday, June 10th. There is no cost, but space is limited. So go to nataliemcclain.com forward slash rose today and save your spot. Also in the show notes, you'll find a full transcript of our conversation, how you can join me in a free online wine and food pairing class, and where you can find me on Zoom, Insta, Facebook, and YouTube, live video every Wednesday at 7 p.m., including this evening, if you were listening to this podcast on the day it's published. That's all in the show notes at nataliemcclain.com forward slash 131. You won't want to miss next week when we chat with Scott Greenberg, also known as The Vine Guy. He's the host of the Wine of the Week show on WTOP Radio in Washington, D.C. Scott started his career in wine journalism as the syndicated wine columnist for the Washington Journal and continues to contribute to Tasting Panel magazine. He joins me from Park City, Utah, to share lots of great stories and tasting tips with us next week. In the meantime, if you missed episode 18, go back and take a listen. As we head into beach weather, you may be wondering if wine makes you fat, or you may not care at all. But there's actually good news about wine and diet, and I'll share a short clip with you now to whet your appetite. Regular moderate wine drinkers tend overall to be slimmer than teetotalers, according to a study published in the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition. A 1991 Harvard study, which followed 138,000 men and women over 10 years, found that increasing their alcohol intake didn't cause the subjects to gain weight. In fact, the women decreased their body weight by an average of 15% instead of gaining the weight predicted according to the calories they consumed. Intriguingly, the men's weight stayed the same. Scientists were mystified about this because it runs counter to the expectation of wine being fattening since it does add calories and should give us the munchies. Wine raises blood sugar levels and then drops them quickly, which can result in food cravings. One reason for the lack of weight gain may be that the human body treats alcohol like a toxin. If you like this episode, please tell one friend about it this week, especially someone you know who'd be interested in the tips that Zach shared. Thank you for taking the time to join me here. I hope something great is in your glass this week. Perhaps a terrific wine for oysters. You don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemcclain.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers. Cheers.